Now, this passage in Acts 1 and 3 is certainly the, along with Peter 3 and 20, 1 Peter 3 and 20, they're what Luther calls the two, well, the locus vexatissimus, the most vexing passage in the whole scripture. And Acts 1 and 3 is certainly the strangest verse in the whole Bible. It's, it's like nothing else in the world. He tells us that for a period, off and on, of 40 days, the Lord showed himself to the apostles after he had been put to death and uh, made very clear to them that he was alive by many signs and um, he taught them things about the kingdom of God. And he ate with them. Synolizomus means ate with them or he camped with them, either one. Synolizomus, you can take it either one. He camped with them or ate with them. You know, we have in the the picture of him meeting them on the beach and so forth. They build a fire and they cook fish and things like that. But this is, a, this is like nothing else anywhere else. You can find parallels to the resurrection and to the ascension in myth and, and uh, ritual and everywhere else. But you'll never find anything like this 40 days. And we're going to talk about it because it's, it's a remarkable thing. Uh, <clears throat> Luke begins the history of the church by telling a period of 40 days during which the Lord visited and taught his disciples after the resurrection. That's the only account of it in the Bible. But we should first of all notice that it's without equal in the Bible for clarity and precision. Like Luke's other prologue, the story of Zacharias and the angel, only told once, doesn't need to be told anymore, it's a forthright factual account that leaves no possible margin for speculation. The closely related themes of resurrection and ascension are favorite subjects of art and church rhetoric. But the 40-day ministry, you'll find nowhere in painting, you'll find no orations on the subject. They just completely baffle. They don't know what to do with it. They just leave it alone. Six weeks of homely visits and instructions have inspired no notable expenditure of breath, ink, or paint. There's nothing in Luke's terse and emphatic statement for the imagination to play with, and that's exactly as the author intends it. He wants it clearly understood at the outset that the resurrection was a reality. To make that perfectly clear... He cites the case of the 40 days as something that nobody ever disputed or could dispute. It's not a subject for speculation. It's an end to speculation. It's uh, not something to be proven. It is the proof. It's the unshakable cornerstone of the whole edifice that he builds of the Acts. The story starts out by telling us, let's get this straight. The Lord was resurrected, and we know this because for 40 days he appeared off and on to the apostles. That's when he taught the things of the kingdom. That's when he established the church in a series of revelations after the resurrection. But uh, neither in general nor in particular does the idea of a post-resurrection mission appeal to Christian scholars. They don't like it at all. And because of the discovery of new manuscripts today, they're fighting it furiously, trying to find some way out of it. But it can't be done. Many are frank enough to admit that they simply don't like it. Uh, that's the real reason, of course, uh, a very recent M.E. Dahl says, half of it I like and half of it I don't. Oh, that's Scherer. It's Dahl who says, the point is, do we or do we not like the answers? If we like it, we'll believe it. If we don't like it, we won't believe it. That's your solution. Well, is that a scientific approach to something? It's the way we do, but that's the way... <laughs> so this man says, half of it, this Scherer says, half of it I like, half of it I don't like, I'll believe the part I like, and I'll throw out the part I don't like. And Remick, in Encounter, this is Robinson, who's recently written a book on it, and he deplores what he calls the gruesome doctrine of the resurrection of this physical integument. It's a loathsome thing. They just deplore it, and they always have. The doctors don't like this sort of thing. It's uh, nothing that can be handled. For many, the possibility of such an event is not even to be discussed. Here's an interesting thing. Uh, uh, J. Davies, J.G. Davies recently wrote a book on the ascension in which he treats this. And he says, uh, now I have to reject it, not because of any personal prejudice or anything like that, but because of the evidence. But a few pages before, he had said, we're bound to conclude that such an occurrence is not only improbable, but impossible. Well, if you start out assuming that it's impossible, you're not going <laughs> to... What are you wasting your time for studying it any further? Um, Bo Rijka, who has written a very important works on this subject, the Swedes especially are concerned with the post-resurrection activity of the Lord. An awful lot's being written about this today. What did the Lord do after he was resurrected? Did he really come and talk to people and all that sort of thing and eat with them? Well, nobody wants to believe it today, and yet all this new stuff is making it more and more obvious that that's something like that happened. So that's why so many people are writing about it. He says this is any time, he says, we find anything suggesting the supernatural, we can assure, assume that it is 
a Lucan fiction. It's a fiction that Luke made up. You don't want to believe it. See, the real reason is we don't like it. But Van Unick, the Dutchman, says it was one of those things which later generations could only impugn as heretical and therefore preferred to forget. So we have others. Carl Schmidt, years ago, uh, in a very early document dealing with this, not so many years ago either, says, uh, I won't even consider the fiction that this actually happened, but we'll now discuss it, which he does for hundreds of pages. But he wouldn't even consider the fiction that really happened. I don't know why they bother about this. And as Bousset said in his work, Curious Christus, I have located that, thus the early church invented, dreamed, and spun its webs of imagination and so forth. So there is quite a large school that won't even consider it seriously, won't take it seriously. After all, a thing like that, I, uh, a girl from Vietnam, she's not here, so it's all right now, I don't see her. Uh, I happened to mention this to her casually the other day, and she just whooped with laughter. She thought it was the funniest thing she ever heard of, and come to think of it, it is. It puts the whole thing on the same basis that Joseph Smith put religion on. <laughs> people just won't take that. It's just too funny for words. Angels coming and talking to people. Then here the Lord comes for 40 days and comes and eats with people and, and talks with them and things like that. That is something. She thought that was the very... I mean, the, the most primitive savages of the jungle wouldn't be naive enough to believe anything like that. See, this is the position everybody takes. No wonder it gives everybody a jolt. <laughs> well, it's astonishing. Oh, others say it's at best a myth. Such things, he quotes uh, Karl Barth, says, such things are to be taken seriously, but not literally. We take them seriously. Well, that's the explanation. <laughs> and Joachim Jeremiah, speaking of this same thing, says, we can only know Jesus clad in the garb of myth. We never know what really happened. It's all a myth. It was made up after. It's astonishing how many Christian writers, in producing exhaustive treatises on every aspect of the, re of, of the resurrection, uh, Severus of Antioch, his homily, a hundred pages, exhaustive treatment proving the reality of the resurrection, never mentions the 40 days. The same M.E. Dahl has written this big book called The Resurrection of the Body. He never mentions Acts 1 and 30, never mentions 40 days, which Luke gives as the proof, you see. This is the one thing nobody ever questioned. But none of those Jackson and Lake have a big book, a commentary on the book of Acts. This verse is not mentioned in it. Isn't that odd, the way they treat it? Here, very recently... Just last year, the end of 63, Volvort, who is quite a conservative man, composed a careful list of the 17 appearances of Jesus after the resurrection, no mention of the 40 days. He wouldn't even consider it. And so it goes. The, uh, well, we have lots of, Gresser in his study, the same thing. So they uh, studiously avoid it. They don't want to talk about it as if they were ashamed of it, and indeed the doctors of the church have been ashamed of it. They have apologized lavishly for the crude literalism of the primitive Christians and their uneducated successors and employed all the arts of the schools to accommodate the embarrassing story to the taste of gentlemen and scholars. This is to be understood in a symbolic sense. It's not to be taken literally. And from the time of Oregon on, they fell all over themselves to say, for heaven's sake, don't think we're crude enough to believe this sort of thing. Well, this is the whole point. This is why Luke tells it. This is the one thing that bangs the door on... On, um, on allegory and symbol and say this is the way we're going to understand it. Luke says, now let's make it clear we're talking about real things here. That's just what they don't want to do. The docs of the church very early got rid of that. They have claimed the story is insufficiently attested. This is a very common argument because it only occurs in one verse. Well, how many important things the Bible only mentioned once? The uh, example of Zechariah would be another, the same sort of thing. It's never mentioned again. Isn't it an interesting thing that the, the transfiguration... Um, and one of these very recently discovered documents says the only time men ever saw Jesus as he really was was during the transfiguration. There they saw the real, the real Jesus Christ. But it's never mentioned by any of the fathers of the church. It's never mentioned in any of the other writings of the New Testament. It's never mentioned in the apostolic fathers. You would go for the next three or four hundred years, you'd think there never had been a transfiguration. It's never mentioned by the writer. That's strange. The fact that the thing is me uh, mentioned only once doesn't prove anything one way or the other. It's rather a it's rather a desperate argument. Uh, the, um, and they say, well, he tells a different story. Well, and even if that's enough, they say he tells a different story elsewhere. And even if he doesn't tell a different story elsewhere, because it appears that the story at the end of the book of Luke, the, the gospel, as a fellow called Moore has recently showed, is certainly not contradictory. 
But even if it doesn't contradict it, uh, we must remember the ancients often meant things differently from what we think they do. Their words have different meanings than ours. Um, very recently, this man Dahl says, it's unlikely that the Apostle Paul's logic bore any resemblance to ours, whether deductive or inductive. Totally different thought forms, so we can't hold them responsible for these things. We can't say these things mean what we think they do. And even if their words uh, mean what we think they do, their ideas belong to alien thought forms that perhaps we'll never grasp at all. The famous saying of Albert Schweitzer, Jesus of the first century cannot live in the 20th century. I just can't grasp him or comprehend it. Well, come to think of it, he couldn't live in the first century, if you remember what they did to him then. <laughs> it's exactly what they do to him now. It was just as strange. He, they were just as outraged. They were just as offended and just as shocked and scandalized then as we are today. But they couldn't adjust. Yes, yeah, they accommodated all right by removing the obstacle, by removing the uh, source of annoyance. Uh, but that's what they do today, but they don't have to do it so violently. Then... Um, they say, even if we can grasp, grasp those forms, the writer themselves are confused. Thus, uh, S.M. Gilmore says, the, both John and Paul found it difficult to distinguish the work of the risen Christ from that of the Spirit. They were poor, confused men. They didn't understand what they were talking about. We can distinguish. They couldn't. Uh, this is another typical uh, gambit here. Um, they contradict themselves and each other from the very beginning. The fathers of the church say, well, of course he didn't really eat. It says he ate, but of course he wouldn't really eat because God doesn't eat. So we'll immediately have to give that a different interpretation, and that's what they did. That would be a contradiction otherwise. Uh, the favorite argument is flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom, which Kirsa Blake said is the very opposite of Luke's belief that the risen Christ had a body of flesh and blood. Well, even if Luke said nothing of the sort, and of course he didn't, we are dealing here with types and images, they say, which can't be taken literally. These things are prefigured. This is just a type of a sort of thing. You find all sorts of 40-day teachings. You find Moses on the mountain being taught by God for 40 days. You find Elijah on the mountain being taught by God for 40 days. So is it surprising that you find, well, Tobit being taught by an angel for 40 days on a mountain? So is it surprising that you find Christ, uh, the risen Lord, teaching his disciples for 40 days on a mountain? It's just a prefiguration. It's a type of thing that happens. You don't need to take it literally. The man number 40 itself, you see, is a ritual thing. Um, <clears throat> then, moreover, they say, look, this is a very popular argument today. Easter and Pentecost and Ascension and Transfiguration and even Parousia, the Second Coming, are all parts of one undifferentiated experience. And may well, we're quoting somebody here, may well be different ways of describing the same occurrence. They say, now look, when you come right down to it, uh, the Lord appeared in glory at Easter, didn't he? The Lord appeared a glory at his ascension 40 days later, didn't he? Well, they're really the same thing. It's the same event. He went from the tomb up to heaven. That's what nearly everybody is saying today. And that's the case, of course. What about the transfiguration? He appeared in glory on the mountain to the three apostles there. Well, that's obviously just a prefiguration of this, and it's obviously just a copy, as Edward Meyer pointed out years ago, of Moses talking to the Lord on the mountain long before. Well, he doesn't realize, you see, that... Uh, that things do happen according to patterns in history as well as in uh, things like this. Things do seem to repeat themselves. After all, look at the parallel between Washington crossing the Delaware and Xerxes crossing the Hellespont. A military venture, a surprise attack, a great undertaking, heroically led, and so forth. Obviously, Washington was prefigured in the story of Xerxes and is an invention. It's a fiction. You can show that. <laughs> well, you can take any kind of historical event and show that it's been prefigured. Everything you do is prefigured. Our life here is a type and a way. We keep repeating the same cycles in our own lives and our own experiences. And you notice the heavenly pattern of things, the revelations of things, are repetition. When the angel comes, he repeats what the prophets have said before. When, Zach when the angel did appear to Zacharias and to Mary, he quoted the scripture, he quoted the Old Testament, and they answered back in Old Testament. When Moroni appeared to Joseph Smith, he quoted this, the Bible. And how much of the words of Jesus are quotations from the Old Testament? They said, well, <laughs> obviously he's just quoting the Old Testament. Well, of course he is. God's plan has always been the same from the beginning, and it's worked out from dispensation to dispensation, following much the same patterns and same plans. The same types of manifestations occur, but as soon as they can show, aha, there was another manifestation just like that, well, this is a fraud. This is obviously just the transfiguration story carried over. Or this is obviously just the, well, and what about Christ coming again in glory? They say today, well, of course, the second coming is the same sort of thing. And the Lutherans are firmly, con uh, are firmly uh, committed to that doctrine now that the second coming of Christ has already been realized. After all, Easter was the triumph, wasn't it? Wasn't that the triumph over death? Everything after that's an anticlimax. And what a nuisance. This is why they 
take the 40 days. It's so logically and artistically disturbing. You want to describe a smooth curve from the depths below to the heavenly realms above, and the Lord passed from the one to the other in one glorious manifestation. That's what everybody wants to put today. But here he has to stop off for 40 days. <laughs> As one... Uh, Catholic writer puts it, he says he, he has to stop off to sit around eating dirty food with low-class apostles <laughs> for, for six weeks, he said. He couldn't understand it. He says vile and filthy human food he had to eat for that period. Yet his whole purpose in being there, as the man says in the next paragraph, incidentally, was to show that the body is not vile and filthy at all, showing them that he was really physically there. Well, um... This mystic unity is spoiled, both artistically and logically, by the awkward interlude of the 40 days, an annoying anticlimax, the, the resurrection, all this glory and so forth, and then for him to come down in such a homely form. I mean, sometimes they take him for a merchant. Mary took him for the gardener, you know. Uh, they were walking along the road. They didn't recognize him. He was just an ordinary person. He appeared not only to all the people, but only to witnesses chosen. And when the 500 were there, uh, they worshipped him, but... Some doubted. They didn't even see him. It, it was a very ordinary sort of thing. Brigham Young used to say, if Jesus Christ would walk into this conference, you'd never recognize him as anything but an ordinary person. And this is the way he appeared during the 40 days. He does not appear in glory. Uh, he mounts up and leaves him in glory, the ascension after, but he comes and teaches them as an ordinary person. This mystic unity, you know, we say, is spoiled that way. This in, uh, an annoying anticlimax to the resurrection and an embarrassing delay in the triumphal procession which should, with irresistible logic and impeccable taste, pass directly from the darkness of the grave to the brilliance of the celestial throne. <laughs> but for all the struggles of the learned, incidentally, this is a first draft of an article I wrote some time ago. This is no good, so I'm dishing it out here. This isn't the one we're going to use. No, we comment on it as we go, so it follows the outline. <clears throat> uh, but for all the heroic struggles of the learned to escape the net of the gruesome the gruesome doctrine of the resurrection of this physical integument, the net still holds and the thrashings and convulsions still continue. For one thing, all the above arguments against the 40-day ministry can easily be interpreted as arguments in its favor. If normal people find a story absolutely incredible, it's not likely that men invented it. Apparent contradictions can be shown to be in the minds of the readers rather than the writers. Long ago, Hippolytus, one of the very earliest fathers commenting, says, you notice the blood isn't, isn't in this picture at all. The blood is the corruptible element in us, that's why in so many of the early covenants, like that of Noah, uh, they were forbidden to partake of blood because the, the divine meal was to end. You see, there was to be no more blood sacrifice later on. The blood is the corruptible. That's the mortal part. And, of course, a resurrected being wouldn't have that. Uh, uh, Ambrose puts it very nicely later on. He says, uh, before the resurrection, Christ was a man. After he was a god. Of course, he wouldn't go through the same sort of things. After he wouldn't be the same sort of being. But this flesh and blood issue is of their own invention, you see. When Cursor Blake says, ah, flesh and blood, and everybody does this, flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom, therefore there can't be a physical resurrection. What's a physical resurrection got to do with flesh and blood? Nothing at all. Then, um, ancient thought forms can be checked by the behavior of an Ignatius who was willing to give his life to show how he interpreted the resurrection. Very clear on this. Parallels and prefigurements were perfectly obvious to the ancients themselves. They were quite aware of all those parallels. And Luke may well have chosen the 40-day formula precisely because it was traditional and symbolic. That's why the Lord did it that way. We have a, Well, it's like 12 apostles. We have 12 here. There were 12 in the time of Christ. There were 12 tribes of Israel. Obviously, it's just a prefiguration, just a type. There's not a real 12 anymore. That's just a myth. No, the Lord deliberately chooses 12 each time. Well, the defenders of the 40-day ministry are just have just as bad a time as those who attack it. They're as helpless as they are. Plainly, the key has been lost when serious commentators can inform us that the 40-day visit was merely, one Catholic writer says, a friendly gesture, an example of condescension and friendship by one who had more urgent business elsewhere. <laughs> or... Um, then um, they tell us that it was... Uh, Necessary to take all 40 days to prove the resurrection of the flesh to the apostles. It proved it. He proved it to Thomas in 40 seconds, didn't he? Thomas was completely convinced. Why would it take 40 days? Well, they said he had, they had to overlearn their lesson because they had to teach it to an over-skeptical world. This is a favorite argument with Catholic commentators, incidentally. Uh, another explanation is that 40 days was a tenfold recompense for the 40 hours of anguish occasioned by the Lord's absence in the tomb. The... Uh, 
The apostles suffered anguish for 40 hours while the Lord was in the tomb. So to pay them back, to make up for the damage, the Lord spent 40 days with them. This is quite... Uh, the medieval commentators like this explanation. They're fond of it. Um, yet another is that it had to be 40 days because 40 is a perfect number. Venerable Bede uses that argument. Some explain the period as a long weaning process to draw the apostles away from undue attachment to each other so that they could separate without too much pain when they went on their missions. Or they use this word weaning again to wean them away from the Lord's person so that they wouldn't be too upset at the ascension. There's another. And the strangest of all, it was to wean them away. Hildebrand says this. It was to wean... wean Hildebert, not Hildebert, Hildebert. Great difference. To wean them away from the Lord's person. Uh, no, to wean them away from thinking in physical terms that they might ascend to the immaterial and intellectual realms of the spirit and not be bound by thinking. So he spends... 40 days having them eat with, eating with them and having them shake his hand and so forth to show that they should break away from physical contacts and think in terms of intellectual abstractions. This is why he spent the 40 days, according to some commentators. Again, 40 days is described as a long, lingering farewell. And even a very recent commentator calls it 40-odd days of frustration and inaction. <laughs> or else it was a delaying period. They like to explain it this way. Chrysostom does this, and Theophylactus and others follow him. He says it was like a general holding back his forces for the psychological moment to build up his strength so that when he did finally let the apostles loose, they were irresistible. They just went out and mowed them down. Uh, that was the idea. Or another says it was like a parent holding an apple back from a child so the child will appreciate it more when it gets it. All this sort of thing. Well, if anything like the great 40 days, as it's been called, occurred in fact, it is of enormous importance, lying where Luke puts it at the very root of the Christian faith. Yet its significance completely escapes the commentators who view it as an odd and rather interesting interlude. They like to use the word interesting. Um, some of them talk about it here. Yes, here. The conversations of the great 40 days must have been of intensest interest, yet these things are wrapped about with thickest darkness. See, in the end, they all admit we don't know anything. It's just pure guessing what happened. And Scott says, and a great deal more passed on these most interesting subjects than is anywhere recorded. It was just interesting, though. It was more than interesting. I think the Lord had a purpose. It must have been tremendously important. But we don't have anything about it. This is a surprising thing. The, uh, so, since they're deadlocked, we're justified in proceeding on the assumption, however tentative, there may be something there, namely the Luke's assertion which has been left untouched by its defenders and its attackers alike. Nobody's made a dent in it. But how about the new stuff? The, um, if we would proceed further in this area, as Kester notes, we really, if we really want to find out, this is quoting him, we must hearken to the extra-canonical words of the Lord, whether genuine or not, as an important voice of the earliest Christianity. So we go to these new discoveries. Some are old that they have to be completely reevaluated in the light of the new discoveries. The new ones are by far the most important, though, what we're going to talk about here. And here we find a surprising thing, first of all, that, uh, say, are we following the outline here? <laughs> we contribute? Yes, these are things we've mentioned here. Uh, so here we are on page two. What do the early Apocrypha <laughs> say about the 40-day ministry? Well, we've mentioned everything on page one, so don't complain. Uh, now, this is a surprising thing. These are the early writings that nobody knew what to do with, you see. Until recently, we've been discovering so many of them so very early that we've got to do something with it, namely, recognize them as genuine Christian doctrines. This is what they believed in the early church. And what's the thing they talk about? More than anything else, their favorite subject is the 40 days, the thing that nobody else will touch later on. It's their favorite subject. The bulk of the writings have to do with the teachings of the Lord during the, uh, to the apostles, the secret teaching of the Lord to the apostles after the resurrection. The, uh, <clears throat> this indicates the early Christians, in contrast to the later churchmen, lay great emphasis on what the Lord taught during the 40 days, and that important groups of them believed that they actually possessed that information. When uh, we next proceed to uh, collect everything they have said on this particular subject, we get quite a sizable volume of stuff. And it isn't random or patchwork stuff like the Gnostics were turning out. 
it is a very consistent doctrine, body of rites and uh, ordinances, and a complete explanation of what happened to these teachings, what would become of them, and why they would be lost. All that is clearly stated. We are surprised to discover that what we get is not a fortuitous hodgepodge of mythology and ritual, as the Gnostics cooked up, nor a corpus of extravagant variations on familiar themes, nor a wanton play of symbol and allegory, but the consistent recurrence of certain basic themes which hang together in a thoroughly consistent and logical system of doctrine and ritual. The main themes are five as we treat them here. Um, of all these writings, we have Gospels of this, uh, Acts of this, and Gospels of Thomas and of Philip, and Gospels of various people among them, Gospels of the Twelve Apostles, and Testaments, Testaments of the Twelve. Uh, but uh, there's no Gospel of the Forty Days. You mentioned why is there none with that title. Uh, Schmidt said it was because nobody had the nerve to invent one. I wouldn't, but heavens, they had the nerve to invent anything you can imagine. All the other Gospels are faked. I mean, they don't hesitate in the Acts, for example, in the pseudo-Acts of the Apostles. The fact that a thing never happened is the least thing in the world to deter them. In fact, that's the one thing that gives them the green light. If it never happened, you can say anything you want about it. And they do. They revel in it. It's when you deal with the realities that they won't touch it, that they lay off. But as um, Ambrose said, how can you write... Well, as Andrew says, the Lord before the resurrection was a man, after he was a God. Well, you can't write acta about God. He doesn't have vicissitudes and suffer the doings. All we're told here is what he te teaches and the occasions on which he teaches. Because that's what he did. It says he came, he uh, ate with them, and he taught them the things of the kingdom. But he didn't go around suffering uh, persecutions uh, and tribulations and the vicissitudes of human life. That is what comprised the the writings known as the Acta, Acts of the Apostles and, and Acts of various saints and so forth. And, of course, there's no Acts of the Forty Days because there were no Acts then, there were teachings. Well, but we do have these teachings. Um, the Apocrypha, dealing with the Forty Days, which means most of the early Apocrypha, are all constantly and consciously opposing the dominant trend in the church of the time, which is toward a de-eschatologizing and de-literalizing of the old concepts, especially that of the resurrection of the flesh. The, uh, <clears throat> since the old literalism steadily lost ground and was finally driven from the field in the days of Augustine, we have here an explanation for the minimizing of the 40 days in the later theology of the church. They don't like it. The 40-day thesis is the sheet anchor of the old Christian opposition to the intellectualism of the schools. And when the intellectualism won out, which they did, smashing a victory in the fourth century, then the old wives' tales had to go. They junked all that stuff and got rid of it. They felt lost without it later on, and it carries on in popular Christianity, various aspects of it. This explains why it went. The, the first teaching is this emphasis on the literal resurrection. That's why nearly all of them, see, concentrate on this 40-day period because they're fighting for the old doctrine of the literal resurrection which the church wants to get rid of. And all these early apocrypha, the orthodox apocrypha, are defending it. They tell us how uh, important it is and also how unpopular it is and what they're, what they're up against. Now, more important is the insistence throughout the purported 40-day teachings on the strictest secrecy. All these teachings are to be kept very secret, all of them. The Gospel of Thomas begins, these are the secret words which the living Jesus spake. See, that character, living Jesus, means the, the risen Jesus. It's used as a sort of code. Secrecy is the essence of Apocrypha as such, as we all know. But there's more than a useful device for mystifying the public and evading responsibility. It's becoming increasingly apparent that the teachings of the early church were indeed confined to a limited circle. Not to mystify, but on the principle that knowledge should only be given to those who ask for it, but should always be given to them. They always emphasize this, too. It's the treasure hidden in the field. You have to dig for it. Don't give it to them, the Lord said to his apostles. They say, to, to whom shall we give it? He said, to those that ask for it. Remember in the next verse, after pearls before swine, he says, if they ask, give it to them. If they seek, they shall find. If they knock, it'll be open. If you want it, you can have it. But don't force it on anyone. It should be kept from them otherwise. And this is characteristic of all the early teachings of the church. The... Uh, <clears throat> As the last and highest revelation, as this is called, the teaching of the 40 days was top secret. The canon contains nothing of it but the opening words, O fools and slow of heart. 
The Lord speaks to the apostles, telling them how badly they need the instruction he's about to give them. We don't have a word of it. Not a word of what follows, and that's just what we want. We have what went before, but so did the apostles and didn't convert them. They didn't understand it. So we have in the New Testament nothing of this teaching but the opening words, rebuking the apostles and showing how badly they needed the instruction they were about to receive. Yet that instruction is withheld from us. Churchmen have conceded the existence of an unwritten teaching given to the Lord by the apostles and handed down by the church, but when they asked to produce it, men like Clement of Alexandria uh, can give us nothing but the commonplaces of the schools. They admit today, quite frankly, that secrecy was the policy of the early church, but they say, well, it was introduced in the third century with the founding of the catechetical schools. But if you read the, uh, the policy stated by the men who founded those schools, Clement and Oregon, they say that they're following the pattern of the early church, that they're simply doing these things because these things were not taught publicly of old, therefore they can only be taught behind closed doors to catechumens who are investigating the gospel, but not to the public in general. See, the church has denied that anything has ever been lost, that anything was ever secret. They have to. To uh, admit that is dangerously near to admitting bankruptcy, you see. Because if anything is missing, anything important is missing, where are you? How good are your calculations? The, the object and the goal of scholasticism, scholastic philosophy and Catholic theology, as well as, as Protestant, is to arrive, as St. Augustine says, as absolute certitude, to be as sure of a thing as you are, as he says, that two and three make seven. Be as sure as that. Well, your calculations are full of holes if things are missing, if there's data you don't have. And don't think this doesn't worry people. So from the time of Irenaeus on, they have hotly and strenuously denied that anything has been lost. And the slogan today by this new Catholic school, uh, Hugo Rahner and people like that, Jung, is from the housetops. Everything that Jesus said was meant to be spoken from the housetops. There was nothing secret, therefore we have everything. The reason they're emphasizing that is because this new stuff is being found now, showing that a great deal had been lost. Their agent says, no, it can't be lost because there was no such policy. Uh, nothing was kept secret. Yet they admit there was a... St. Basil, for example, is very much taken up with, this, with the secret uh, teachings of the apostles. Uh, it's basic in his whole teaching. They admit an unwritten tradition of the apostles, of higher teachings. But none of them can produce it. If the church still has it, you ask for it, and all they say, they just produce the commonplaces of the schools. And they... Um, By all accounts, the teaching of the 40 days was most likely to be lost. And uh, this is seen in our next example. H.J. Uh, Sheps, a very able Danish scholar, says uh, he compares this to the skins of an onion. The more external, the more superficial documents are the more public and the more accessible. The farther you go in, the more skin you take off, the nearer you get to the real important part of the matter. And he says, we'll never get to that because that has been very carefully smothered, I think I had a quotation here, some, smothered and, uh, and um, what's the word he used? Yes, he says it, it, is, it has been smothered and hidden by the church long ago. They didn't want anybody to get to that, if it ever existed at all. So now they say it doesn't exist, but we know today it did, because look at all that's being found now. Now the most conspicuous single teaching of the 40 days is... Uh, where are we on the outline here? <laughs> hmm. This is in the laws department. See, the teachings themselves predict and explain it. That's what we're talking about now. Because the most emphasized thing, the thing they talk most about, is the future of the church. This is natural, isn't it? The apostles ask the Lord. They're very much concerned. The apostles, in a mood of deep concern and worry, ask the master the natural question, what lies ahead for them in the work in which they're engaged? In nearly all of these, this is one of the questions they ask him. And in reply, the Lord paints a simply appalling picture of utter corruption and desolation, offering no ray of hope in the prospects of this world. There is indeed a promise of comfort and joy, but it's all on the other side. He tells them about the apostasy in detail here. The, we'll get to that in a minute. But the interesting thing is, in this newfound gospel, apocryphon of James, for example, the apostles protest. They say, now, wait a minute, this is the joyful time of the resurrection. What are you talking about gloom and, uh, and death for, about this work coming to an end? And they also ask him in a number of these writings, they say, the apostles themselves, 
raise the natural question, well, now, wait, all this work for just a few people to be saved and so many people be lost? Is this work just going to be taken away? And in every case, the Lord remains unyielding. And he says, that isn't for you to say or not for me to say. That is the will of the Father. He will decide. And who is lost is lost and who is saved is saved. Every case, he gives them that, that hard answer. He will not make a concession there. His predictions of, yes, the apostles protest, but the Lord is uncompromising. His predictions of doom, unlike those in the Jewish Apocrypha, some of these you might suggest uh, the typical Jewish Apocrypha, in which, though I see there's a recent, Daniello has announced that no Jewish Apocrypha are pre-Christian. They're all derived from Christian sources anyway. But the, then they turn right around and say, well, this is just Christi old Jewish Apocrypha. That's the Apocalypse, is where you describe the periods of destruction. See, the old well-known cycle of the blessing, the falling away, the apostasy, then the punishment, until they repent, and finally the Lord returns again. The Lord again restores the covenant. This is the well-known cycle of, uh, of apostasy, punishment, and then restoration. And with it, it's accompanied by a world picture of destruction, upheavals of nature, and so forth. This isn't the way the Lord describes it at all. He doesn't use this imagery at all when he talks about the church. Unlike those in the Jewish Apocrypha, Though following the familiar pattern of apostasy, destruction, and restoration, these are specific and personal. The actors are not legendary prophets and kings, but the very men who sit before him. He tells them how they are to be rejected and take their exit from the world. And the source of danger and destruction is not the pagan, but the Christian society. As Schmidt points out, there's not one mention of paganism anywhere in any of these writings. Nobody worries about that at all. The destruction is all from the church. He says specifically, very specifically, the church will be divided into two parties with complete victory on the party of the corruptors over the party of the saints. He says specifically, it will be completed within two generations. He says that quite a number of times. And it all happens inside. The wolves turn to sheep. The shepherds lead the flock astray. The long winter time of the just settles down. There are over a dozen references to that winter time of the just which lies ahead. As the cosmoplanes, the one who leads the world astray, takes over for a long period of darkness, ruling under the name of Christ, falsely, whose name he bears in deceit, as we're told here. Now, this is, this is the common picture he gives of the future. And nobody liked the picture. See, the apostles even protest here, and so would you. Nobody would invent this sort of thing. No sect or group would like to think of this as the future that lay ahead for them. It wasn't wishful thinking any more than the resurrection was wishful thinking. You notice how much the, the New Testament emphasizes that. The apostles fought it to the last ditch. When various reports came of the resurrection, they said, you're crazy, you're foolish, that such things just don't happen. Thomas didn't happen to be present at the meeting when the others were convinced, but he wouldn't believe it. Unless I see myself, he said, and then instantly he was converted. But they didn't want to believe it. It wasn't their idea. You can't call this the product of wishful thinking. Nobody has wanted to believe in this resurrection story. The Christian fathers threw it out, the resurrection of the flesh, as a gruesome doctrine right at the beginning. The apostles didn't want to believe it themselves. And what does Paul talk about already in his time? They deny the resurrection of the flesh. That's the passage in Corinthians about the baptism for the dead, if the dead rise not at all. But how be it there are some among you that say there is no resurrection of the flesh? And they were saying that right from the time of the apostles. The time of the apostolic fathers, every one of the apostolic fathers, the ones coming next, Make this their main theme. Why don't any of you believe in the resurrection of the flesh anymore? They don't do it. So to say, well, this is just wishful thinking. Oh, no, nobody wanted to believe this. The apostle didn't. Nobody else did. Or have wanted to believe it since. And especially with this, here he gives them this picture of the future. It's a horror. You can see why they gladly get rid of it and have nothing to do with it. Even more complete and explicit is the actual ful fulfillment of these predictions as described by the next men that come along, whose works are classified by Henneke, for example, among the Apocrypha, namely the Apostolic Fathers, of the second generation. They are convinced that what they are beholding is the actual fulfillment of these very prophecies. They see no reason for remaining in the world. They find that there is still work to be done, but it must be done quickly. But little time remains for the church to perform its mission before those two generations are up. And uh, then the night will come when no man can work. The, uh, <clears throat> plainly, this teaching was not calculated to be popular. And the heavy reluctance with which the early patristic writers, now we get to the patristic writers who were straddling the fence, men again, like, uh, like the early ones, uh, Tertullian, Lactantius, Oregon, uh, Athanasius. Well, he's not quite early enough, but the, the third century ones and the first century, uh, Clement of Alexandria. They all accepted this gloomy picture of the church. Hippolytus has a lot to say about it. 
But they do it very reluctantly. They say it makes them sick at the stomach, but this is it, and there's nothing else to do about it. Almost, they don't like it. Well, but in the fourth century, the church won a smashing victory. And Eusebius was able to announce this was an awful mistake. We were all wrong. We changed our mind, the whole thing. And uh, they actually laughed at the teachings of those primitive saints. Uh, uh, Jerome uses the word primitive for them in a rather contemptuous way. And uh, John Chrysostom says, thank heaven we're educated like them and don't fall for that sort of stuff because they were... They were prophets of doom and gloom. They didn't expect a church to be triumphant like this. came as a great surprise in the 4th century. Uh, well, where could this doctrine then have uh, come from? Nobody would willingly invent such a depressing doctrine or accept it without the highest credentials, let alone uh, you wouldn't invent it, but what if it's somebody else invented it? Would you accept a doctrine like that unless it, it came from a, an unquestionable source? That's an unpopular thing. Where could it have come from? The oldest sources, the old sources in which it is found, uniformly attribute it to the teachings of the Lord after the resurrection. Is the one thing he taught. It. Well, the most natural. Uh, now we come up to the doctrinal teaching of the forty days. The most natural question you would ask to a person returned from another world who had been away is, well, what did you see and where did you go? What went on there? Well, and this is exactly what the apostles asked the Lord. And uh, in reply to this question. He gives a report that, again, recalls the Jewish Apocrypha, the image of the other world. See, you have a whole stack of early testamentary literature in which a prophet or a patriarch is about to leave the world and ascend to heaven. We have the testament of Abraham. You have the testament of Isaac. You have the, uh, the testament of the twelve patriarchs. You have the testament of Moses. You have the testament of Isaiah. You have all sorts of testaments. In these testaments, the situation is always the same. The saint is about to leave the world in a sin. And so he brings his sons about him, usually 12, just as the Lord brings his disciples about him, and tells them what's going to happen to them. He gives them each a blessing. It's patriarchal blessing, see? Well, that's what the Lord is doing here. Much the same situation. And he describes, however, an interesting thing. Though he's about to leave the earth, he has already been away and had a vision in every one of these. And he comes back and reports how it is in the other world. Then there are warnings and prophecies to his various children. But he visits the world above. He goes to the various levels of glory he ascends, and then he ascends below, he descends below too. And then he reports what he has seen. Well, the Lord gives something like these to the apostles, but quite different. It's not the same thing at all. Because they go as observers and they say what they saw. The Lord went on a mission and he reports what he did. There's nothing spectacular in this at all. He, it's not the Jewish, the old imagery. He doesn't go to the crystalline heaven and that sort of thing or see the spirits in hell. He goes on a definite mission to preach the gospel and he does it. It's a different thing. They are conducted as spectators to other worlds. He goes for action. The whole emphasis is on the descensus. That means the descent, of course. It's designated by that name today. When the Lord performed a mission, which, as Schmidt observes, was perfectly parallel with his earthly mission. All the spirits below are given a chance to hear the kerygma, meaning the preaching. He goes down to preach. That's what he went for, to preach. They all agree on that as he said, that none may be left without excuse, above or below. And of the hearers, those who accept him, they don't all have to accept the message, gladly follow him and are brought up out of the depths to the light. The, um, such an economy, well, and they receive the baptism, they receive, then they receive the baptism, and then they mount up by degrees or steps uh, to a fullness of glory. Such an economy implied a mounting up by degrees toward heavenly exaltation, and this is a doctrine which is getting a lot of attention today as being a genuine, solid, uh, indisputable early Christian teaching. This is what they taught in the time of the apostles, that we did mount up. There were degrees of glory. Things didn't happen just at once. It was the Gnostics and the Neoplatonic people and the patristic writers who believed that the spirit automatically, this was a teaching of Plotinus, uh, upon being released from the prison of the flesh, automatically returned, fled with high speed to God, as fast as it could go to the bosom of God. It was just the two. There was a prison of the flesh and that. Well, this isn't early Christian teaching at all. This is what's adopted later as standard Christian theology after the fourth century, because it was a teaching of the schools. goes way back. But uh, such an economy implied a mounting up by degrees toward heavenly exaltation, a doctrine that conflicted with the basic Neoplatonic, Gnostic, Patristic concepts of the spirit, returning naturally and irresistibly to God the moment it's liberated from the prison of material substance. The pre-existence of the human spirit, this is a return, which seeks to return to its heavenly home, uh, is very much emphasized here, but it's not the Gnostic doctrine. 
In the early Apocrypha, in fact, are all sharply anti-Gnostic. Here the soul is not sent to earth as a punishment, as it is in the Gnostic writings, nor imprisoned in the flesh, but sent to be tried and tested in the blessed vessel, as they call the flesh. A physical body whose immortality was guaranteed by the resurrection. The strong early Christian emphasis on the doctrine of the two ways explains this life as a time of probation and easily solves the problem of evil to explain which the Gnostics went to grotesque extremes and the fathers of the church never did solve. They gave it up. They said in the early times, in this early apocryphal writing, this 40-day teaching we're talking about, they say it was all part of a plan laid down in the presence of the first angels at the time of the creation. That Satan rebelled against the plan, was cast out, and is now contributing to it by providing us with the necessary, with his cohorts, with the temptation necessary for this testing situation in which we are. The fall of Adam was no more a ghastly mistake than was the creation of the mirror material world. Christian theology and Gnostic theology has believed that the fall of Adam, being closely associated with the material world, was a horrible mistake, should never have happened. Well, this wasn't taught in those days. The plan is being worked out in a series of dispensations. Well, um, this was the doctrine uh, in outline. Of course, it has elaborations too. But these points are all very strongly emphasized in these writings. The idea of the Lord descending, then his coming up and preaching, uh, and then his preaching, and then his br bringing them up. But they have to baptize them. So this brings us to ordinances. You consider the equation, for example, no dissensus without the kerygma. There's been special articles proving each one of these points by somebody. The Lord wouldn't descend without preaching. No preaching without the seal, they said, without the baptism. No baptism without resurrection, uh, because as many of the church fathers pointed out, that's the whole purpose of baptizing in the plain. No resurrection without a savior, no savior without a sacrifice, no satis sacrifice without a descent. It's, the thing is that these things uh, go together. You can't leave out any of these elements. The ritual elements are part of it. One may not subtract anything from the scheme. You can add anything to suit yourself, but Every one of these elements is indispensable to the whole interdependent pattern. Ritual and doctrinal elements are inextricably interwoven. Recently, Abramovsky has pointed out that the early Apocrypha, we're dealing with more than abstract ideas or symbols. He says all these formulas have a cultic ring. In fact, they have a very realistic cultic ring. There's some real activity behind them. They're not just giving this out as doctrine. We can see plainly that there's a very active um, engagement in rites and ordinances going along with these, uh, with these doctrinal teachings. There was behind it all is the distinct understanding that everything represents some sort of overt behavior and is to be understood in the most literal sense. There is a real supper. It's symbolic, but it's a real supper. They really eat something to celebrate a real resurrection. They don't believe that he was resurrected in spirit only. That sort of thing used to cause the, the apostolic fathers no end of grief. Oh, they would get angry when they hear that. But a real resurrection. After a real descent, he really did descend for a real charisma. He really did preach to them, requiring them to have a real baptism and so forth. The ordinances referred to are strange and remarkable. The dead must receive some sort of baptism. Uh, the baptism is never without anointings and other washings that go with it. This is always part of it, part of the early Christian baptism. They talk about that. And they call these things all separately as seals. They're, they're very much... Uh, uh, taken with this word seal. They use it all the time. This progress. Later on it becomes just the baptism then they drop the word entirely. They talk about the washing as the seal, the naming as the seal, but this is the way they would go through with it. First, this baptism was performed by proxy for the dead and then the person who was baptized would emerge and receive an anointing and then the person would receive a garment. Again, it was a token garment, but it was a real one until the third century. This was indispensable. You had to receive it. All referred to as the seal. And uh, then he would partake of a meal, a special meal, which was a sacrament, which would show his unity. He was now a member of the church. He could now partake of the sacrament. But this was to emphasize that all present were united in one, and the Lord was there in his spirit. His spirit was with them while they were united in one. It's the Feast of the Covenant, pattern on the showbread of the temple, a very recent uh, study by Albert Adam, showed where the Christian sacrament came from, the... Uh, he says the showbread of the temple. It's a very interesting thing. They used to have that in the temple. Twelve loaves set out on the table at all times. They were visible. That's the, that's the showbread. The first rite in the temple in the morning before they did anything else, the priests, twelve priests, would have to meet there and have this bread broken and partake of it as a, in a common meal. This is the way it was done in the early church too. It was a wooden table. It was specially brought in. 
it had nothing to do with sacrifice itself, but it was this, uh, this unity thing. It's interesting there because you see in the Book of Mormon when the sacrament is distributed, they divide it into 12 companies before the sacrament is distributed to them. Well, um, that is in the third Nephi. We may get around to that. These, um, all of these rites, which Alfred Adam has recently shown, were completely lost to the church at an early date, but they were there in the genuine, and they were there. We also hear of a prayer circle at which the Lord leads the apostle in prayer. He has, this is mentioned quite a number of times. The last time it was mentioned at the Council of Ephesus, uh, where the Lord had the apostles stand around in a circle and then he led them in prayer. He would speak a sentence and they would pray after him. This was an important rite in the early church, this prayer circle. Well, though it's still too early to determine how far such things were strictly orthodox, after all allowances have been made, there's a definite residue of early Christian ritual that goes far beyond anything known to later Christianity. And, oh heaven, we haven't mentioned the, the marriage rites that are so important here. The... Uh, the great importance that's placed on the marriage, this is a thing that was parodied and imitated by the Gnostics too, but now we're beginning to realize that it was genuinely Christian, that the highest of all the ordinances was this, this marriage. We may uh, read some passages on this particular thing, but uh, commenting on that, uh, L. McLean Wilson recently said, uh, he points out the fact What's all the early gossip about the Christians, about the outsiders, about their secrecy and all these marriage rites of theirs, all this marriage stuff? Well, he says, where there's smoke, there must be fire, where there was so much smoke. This was the thing that always scandalized them, all these sex stories that were being told about the Christians. Why about them? Why never about the Gnostics? The Gnostics misbehaved themselves, we know. But it was the Orthodox Christians that were always being gossiped about because of their mysterious marriage ordinances and rites that they never tell anybody about. And this got them into a lot of trouble, as we know from the early uh, anti-Christian writers. Well, <clears throat> then, um, we come to, uh, I think we'll read some passages here from some of these writings pretty soon, but as we've mentioned again and again, the doctors of the schools, see, they were closely connected with the universities. They worked together, and the, and, uh, the universities won this combat. They swung the church into their orbit very neatly, as you might expect. And uh, these things still survive in popular Christianity, though, under forms which people seem to have overlooked. Now, for example, if you look at all the earliest Christian legends, you'll find they talk about just one thing all the time. In the pseudo-acts of the apostles, there's one standard miracle beside which all the others are purely coincidental. That is, the raising of the dead performed for the express purpose of convincing a skeptical world of the reality of the Lord's resurrection. All the pseudo-acts of the apostles, all they do from city to city is raise the dead and say, this proves the resurrection of the Lord. But when they do it, the Lord is always standing by them. Sometimes he takes the figure of the apostle, the form of the apostle. Uh, sometimes um, he takes his own form. He appears as Jesus and performs the miracle and raises the dead. Sometimes it's the apostle who's raised from the dead. And uh, it gets very confusing. But they're obsessed with this one idea of, uh, of this one standard miracle. As the apostle performs the miracle, the Lord himself stands by, appearing now as himself, now in the person of the apostle, who's but an understudy or doublet of Jesus. The, uh, there's some interesting instance here. Well, and this is explained, incidentally, that Jesus is always there. This is very often explained as what Jesus meant when he said, I'm going to be with you until you finish the work, remember? He sends them out into the world to preach the gospel to the eleven, and he says, I will be with you till the end of, this, of the period of the eon. And we have at least a hundred references that show us how the early church interpreted this. It meant the Lord would personally be with the apostles on their missions. He would come to them when he needed them. He would be available to them. It is not a great commission uh, by which anyone can claim the presence of the Lord. It was just to the apostles and just limited to them, and it was literally fulfilled in, in these accounts. Uh, and they left this, uh, this very marked uh, corpus, this large corpus of uh, early Christian literature. The most popular demonstration of the resurrection is that attributed to a youthful military hero who is repeatedly put to death, only to be visited by Christ or the angels in the night, restored to blooming health, to deliver a lecture on the resurrection next morning and submit to a new assassination. This goes on and on. It's an absurd thing, but the legend of it's always a military hero, and we'll see that this has a pagan background. 
the saints Victor and Theodore and George and Mercurius and Sebastian and the seven sleepers, the two first uh, Christian lady martyrs, Thecla and Perpetua, belong to this illustrious company, to which are drafted by popular demands of nearly all the names of nearly all the apostles. Most of the apostles in the Acts are put to death many times. Remember, Thomas and Bartholomew carry their skin around for years and performing miracles with it, and uh, they all are put to death. John is put to death many times. Andrew fills whole cities with his blood and so forth. This idea that they're being resurrected, but always they return in the form of the Lord. I mean, he's always around there, uh, getting mixed up in these things. Now, this is associated, can be associated with uh, very popular pagan martyr cults that existed before. The case of Hippolytus is a good example. A typical case is the prudish Hippolytus, um, impaled on a tree and restored to life, and his tragic death, as A.B. Cook says, and triumphant resurrection made him a favorite theme alike on Greek and Roman sarcophagi in pre-Christian times. The idea of a, a young martyred hero. This isn't part of the story. The... Uh, the popularity of the old hero cults explains the easy fusion with the Christian martyrs, but it's definitely a fusion of independent traditions and not the production of one by the other. Why would they choose that particular moment to emphasize? You see, Why would they emphasize that particular aspect of the Christian tradition? When the curtain goes up, you see, on the, on the second century, the whole church is, is fighting. It's seething with conflict and broken into sects and factions over one subject, the resurrection. Everybody's fighting about it. Well, by the 4th century, the whole question has been settled in favor of an intellectual and allegorical interpretation, and the world can at last accept Christianity. So the curtain arises on a new act, the church of the 4th century. But here, whatever the schoolmen may think, the Christian masses are obsessed with the great theatrical resurrection miracles and Christophanies. It goes on the same way. The theme of the 40 days still persists. In an innocent and enduring form, indeed, such as artists and orators can use, freed from the taint of the old Christian origins, but still seeing the essence of Christianity in the post-resurrection visits of the Lord. So you get the uh, apotheosis of the emperor and so forth. So you get the triumphal Christian architecture and re rhetoric of the 5th century in which the emperor is described as the present and invis invisible Lord sitting among his apostles on the earth. And you see on the uh, facades of palaces and cathedrals this image of God on earth sitting among men, teaching and leading them and giving them instructions this time represented as the emperor. But it's the same old theme. 